well, I want to thank him for stepping up today and um, speaking um, on his birthday. And I'm very excited as well that uh, we've got some in-house faculty speaking in the seminar. And I honestly don't know where to start to summarize Tony's outstanding contribution to the world's fishery science. So um, he was the founding director of the Fishery Center in the 1990s. And he has received many prestigious awards, among others, the Babbitton uh, Medal for Lifetime Contributions to Fishery Science. He's a founding editor of the journal Fish and Fisheries. And he's worked for the FAO. So his research, as you all know, focuses on fisheries restoration and um, towards policies improving biodiversity conservation and um, human benefits. And today, Dr. Pitcher will talk um, about evaluating the ethics and sustainability of fisheries. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pitcher. Thank you, Anna. Um, I was encouraged to try and wear some sort of appropriate costume for today. <laughs> uh, fortunately, I see <clears throat> nobody in the audience is wearing anything like that. It took me back to the point once in my career back in Oxford, I uh, actually once gave a lecture just in my underpants. <laughs> It was actually quite strange, but there we are. Um, so I thought, well, perhaps I could rip it. No, perhaps not. At this advanced age, it might not be quite so exciting as it was. <coughs> Back then, there you are. Uh, this talk is uh, actually, uh, I apologize to Fish uh, 520 people because they've probably heard part of this before. Um, and it's actually based on a talk that I gave in the uh, Glasgow Marine Conservation Congress back in uh, back in August. That's why I thought I'd, I'd get rid of the logo, but then I realized it's quite interesting for that sort of giant puffin navigating a, a uh, Viking ship, <laughs> catching a salmon at the same time, <laughs> mounted on a, one of those squirrely um, Celtic motifs that's quite attractive, I suppose, in the sea. But I'd leave it because it's kind of odd and rather nice. So, <clears throat> to move on. Fisheries sustainability and ethics. This is actually part of a much larger investigation of the ethical status of fisheries and how you might measure it in a semi-quantitative fashion and in a rep rep reproducible in a scientific way. Um, and that, that project is being led by uh, by, by uh, Anne. And so this is my contribution to that larger larger project. Um, <clears throat> and the, it's really, this, this talk's designed to try and test a hypothesis that actually sustainability of uh, a fishery is um, is related to, to its ethical status. So the hypothesis is sustainability is sustainability correlated with, with ethics. And we could finish right now because you could say by definition that a sustainable fishery is an ethical one and an ethical fishery is a sustainable one. So we could finish the talk right here, <laughs> but that would be a bit premature. So uh, I've kind of not, not accepted the by definition uh, explanation. Um, is there some simple correlation between the ethical status and the sustainability status is the, what I'm going to address here. And, and then towards the end of the talk, um, we're going to look at a more complex way of looking at it to try and unpack some of the um, indicators of status, both ethical and, um, and, uh, and uh, um, logical, like, uh, to see if there's some relationship there. So what, <clears throat> what can we use as an indicator of ecological sustainability? Well, I thought I'd go to the wonderful Kobe plot. And we'll both start off by talking about Kobe plots because you, there's a really nice online source for many of them. These days. And then the ethical status, how would we measure that? Well, again, there are indicators of, of ethical status, and, and in this talk I'm going to use some of those. But there are more complex ways of looking at ethical status, and I'll have a very brief mention of some of the more complex ways of trying, un, unpacking what is, what is ethics. So the simple hypothesis testing, using the simple approach to it, um, is using 13 case studies. That's, so this is very preliminary work. It's only 13 case studies. Obviously, these days you've got to have <coughs> far more case studies than that to be respectable. So this is pilot work, not published yet. And then to look at the more complex one, I've got two case studies in a little bit more, more detail. And then some conclusions, I guess. The Kobe plot, um, if you look at Kobe on the web, on, on Google, um, you'll get all these photographs of this big hunky guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So the plot is not named after the baseball player. <laughs> it's uh, actually it's not baseball. I think it's American football, whatever that is. Um, basketball. Basketball. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I'm a cricket fan, and there's none here. So <laughs> <problem. laughs> okay. So it's not him. It's the that Japanese city, that a big uh, industrial Japanese city that was virtually flattened in a big earthquake about now, about ten years ago. Um, and <clears throat> there was a meeting there of the um, all the people who worry about uh, tumour assessment around the world um, in 2007. And it was there that they said, well, let's use this simple plot as an indicator of the status of our tumour fisheries. And this is the plot that was published by, by uh, Mark Wanda uh, and others um, as a, as in the output from that, that meeting. And so what they said is that we should be able to divide up the, the, the simple plot, we'll look at it in more detail in a moment, and show areas that are good, and areas that are terrible, and areas that are intermediate in terms of the sustainability status of the tuna fishery. And you can see there that this tuna fishery is, this is from uh, somewhere in the Pacific, and it's tracked across from a green area, which is like a good, nice place to be, <clears throat> and it goes up here to, towards the middle, which is where it's supposed to be for sustainability, and, and the confidence limits overlap the, the crossing point here which is presumably quite good, although of course the compass limits do actually include some red, which is a terrible area to be in on the COVID plot. Um, so that was what was published, and it's been <clears throat> very widely adopted by <clears throat> lots of our stock assessment uh, colleagues and others um, as an indicator of what's going on. So to look at it in a bit more detail, here's the COVID plot. It plots the uh, biomass of the fish stock that you're looking at uh, against the uh, fishing rate, which can either be uh, catch unit effort, or it can be f uh, fishing mortality rate, or um, it could be effort as well, actually, depending if there is a difference between fish. But, uh, <clears throat> and, and the two axes go from, uh, as is conventionally the case, from low to high. Um, and so the plot is divided up into regions where, uh, to the left and right, and above and below, the point where biomass is um, equal to the biomass that it would be at, at MSY, classic MSY point, and that, again, there is a little bit with who's doing it, so when they take MSY or some other reference point, but basically whether it's above or below the reference point in terms of biomass, and above or below the reference point in terms of the fishing rate or fishing mortality rate. So that, that gives four quadrants, and uh, this is the way it was divided up. This one down here is okay, it's green, nice place to be. This one here is awful, everything's too, too, too low a biomass and too high a fishing rate and then these two are intermediate. And it varies whether people call this one worse than that one, or whether the yellow is better than, yellow is worse than pink. I don't know. And some people color them the same color. So uh, there's a bit of argument there. But I've, I've taken this <coughs> as meaning okay with score in my um, sustainability status terms. I get a simple score if it's in the green square um, of, um, uh, 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 of um, uh, four out of four. And uh, awful would be, I think, one out of four, or zero out of four. So the complex work that went into drawing that Hobby plot for a particular fishery translates in my terms just a simple score, whether it's from one to four. Bad. So some case studies um, chosen to try and do this. <clears throat> I went to, first of all, I went to the Myers, Rand Myers Legacy Database based in Dalhousie, and I struggled with that, because um, I don't speak SQL very well. Um, and then I found that our colleagues down south of the border in Seattle have set up the most wonderful animated website of Comey Plots. In fact, they're, they're animated. You can go onto the web, and they animate. They actually jump about and move. And it's like really great fun. And you can get all of the data. You can get all the, the, the um, data in tables, and it sucks the data down. In, in um, CSV files, and so you can actually, it's pretty, very nice. Uh, I have some criticism of that site, which I won't mention here unless somebody asks me about it, but um, it is actually very good. It's the best one I've seen for getting Kobe block from all around the world. So I chose <coughs> for this particular pilot piece of work um, just for uh, 13 to 15 uh, case studies, and they're plotted here um, on the Kobe plot. And there's one, this is the Newfoundland card, which is very low biomass, but still nevertheless very low fishing mortality rate um, related to where it's fine. And uh, the North Sea cod is a contrast where the biomass is terribly low and the fishing rate is still, when the COVID plot was drawn, was still very high. 
Um, there's a BC fishery in here somewhere, BC sable fishes, and they, oh look, it's near the middle. Um, <coughs> and some under, so-called underfish fisheries where, like the South African jackman, which is a uh, high biomass, uh, low fishing mortality. So I tried to choose some point, choose some, I tried to choose some points that were in um, each of the quadrants. It, it, this quadrant proved a bit of a problem, but I did the best I could quickly, and I could probably do better later. Picking more of these case studies. Um, so that's my status from sustainability in <coughs> ecological terms. And then the ethical status, well, <coughs> that could be done from some sort of synoptical ethical analysis using uh, Rackfish or the, um, the um, uh, matrix, uh, the um, ethical matrix, which is another way that's been tried to, been, been used to try and evaluate status. Um, at the moment, but those two are probably going to be merged by me, which I haven't done it yet, so I couldn't use that. So mainly in this talk, I'm going to use some of the surrogates for ethical status, which may or may not be good. Um, the best one, I think, is the one published by you, <laughs> but surprisingly, yeah, the best one's published by me, right? So um, that is compliance with the United Nations FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, uh, which we published in 2009, I think. Um, and that is the result of uh, 40, yeah, 42 questions. Yeah, that's a nice number. 42 questions uh, which cover the uh, Article 7 of the UN Code of Conduct uh, and uh, express compliance with that code. And of course, it is an ethical code because the Code of Conduct is, by definition, an ethical code. So, um, and in fact, if people really complied with it, the fisheries of the world would be a wonderful thing. They don't. So that, the, their score and compliance score turns out to be quite a useful uh, index of their ethical status. And then you can do a quick and dirty one, which we did, which isn't published, we couldn't have to be published, but we've done a quick and dirty one for various places. Um, there's a fisheries management quality index published by uh, Camilla Mora. Um, and I think I, I discovered I was a co-author on that, so I better not say, but it's a bit, bit dodgy, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, and then there's a, there's a wonderful corruption index published by Transparency International. It's a US agency that, well, we think we know who finds it, but uh, it claims to be independent. <laughs> uh, it's used by business people around the world to, to discover, you know, um, if they're going to do business in a new country, they look up the corruption index to see how much they might have to. <laughs> the local costs, as they're called, might. I mean, um, and there's also an even worse thing run by the CIA called the Failed State Index. Syria doesn't do very well right now. But, um, Canada doesn't do as well as you might think, actually, on that score. I don't look at it. Um, there's also the Governance Index, quite a complex index, which is the average of six sub indices uh, published by the World Bank. And that comes out, I think, every two years that's updated. So these are all. Um, uh, surrogates for their ethical, the ethical status of the fisheries in that country. Some of them better than others. And just to show you that um, if you take the UN Code of Conduct compliance score on the, um, on the horizontal axis and plot it against the um, quick and dirty ethical status score that we developed, um, then you can see there's a very high correlation. It's about 80% COD, so that's actually quite good. Unfortunately, this, <laughs> this score is not, not uh, very independent. So let's proceed to see if we can test our hypothesis using uh, initially the Covey plot. I'm going to use other, the standard Covey plot. I'm, I'm going to use other things in a moment, but we'll just go with the basic Covey plot as originally published. So it's got these, uh, these four status areas that a score, depending on which. Um, depending on which quadrant they're in. I'm not quite sure what this white line means. I think that's a mistake. It's not, we don't mean that there's a little corridor in there that means you don't get any score at all. It's just a, a glitch in the PowerPoint. So we can plot our, our data on top of that. And there they are. So you can see, I, I was quite generous. I gave, if, 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 a, if a fishery was on the borderline, I gave it the better score. So it was kind of generous, right? Now, the ethical index, um, is the Covey pot quadrant is going to determine which coloured zone you're going to be, and that's plotted against the various ethical indices. And so here they are. Um, we've got the 
ethical, the quick and dirty ethics score, we've got Morris, uh, Cameron and Morris management quality score, and we've got the code of conduct compliance, and you can see that there's no um, <laughs> hypothesis not supported, right? There's no evidence from this pilot work that, that uh, ethics is, ethical status is correlated with sustainability. I don't bother. <laughs> so try something else. Second method. Well, this is a Kobe plot diagram showing the sort of areas of quality from our colleague. It's, it's not here. It's, it's Murdoch. Right? <laughs> so it's quite complex. And so I've colored that in with qualities from good to bad, green through to and purple is the worst. And purple is the uh, is Murdoch's uh, collapsed area, yeah. right? See, Murdoch himself plots <laughs> in the overexploited. <laughs> At least he's not collapsed, right? So <laughs> I guess he would probably prefer to be using the recovery. But there you are. So that's the quality from Murdoch. Uh, and you, we can overlay that onto um, our test data. So it's sort of overlaid there on the the test data from the COVID plot, and, and I've had to extrapolate the areas for those that are outside the original, outside Murdoch's area. It's above two here on the exploitation axis. Um, it's not in his plot, but it's assumed that these just carry on. And then we give them the scores. So giving them the scores, well, no oh dear. Um, quite pretty, but really not, <laughs> again, not, not significant. Sadly, hypothesis not supported. So, since then I've found one other method um, which comes from our, well, yeah, from down, the road, down below the border. You can see he's given me a nudge. Probably a secret signal. It's probably, this, is a, this is Ray's way of doing it, right? So, there we are. <clears throat> Daniel's not here, so I was allowed to show this. <laughs> There's been a red rag to a ball of this <laughs> And um, he, oh my goodness, he published well, this quite complex COVID plot. This is, uh, this is the result, as far as I can understand the paper, um, this is the result of a series of simulations of a whole stack of fisheries whose details are based on material in the Myers database, but he simulated them with a, with a complex simulation. Looking at the probability of fisheries in different places on the COVID plot, Look at the probability of them increasing and recovering, um, or, or just about basically increasing from where they were. And so that's why the ones up here, where uh, they already have a high biomass, are less likely to increase than the ones down here, where they had a low biomass. And the curious result, I mean, this is the result, the curious result is that it doesn't really bear much relation to the quadrants, the, the classical quadrants of the Kobe plot. It looks really as though the area of sustainability is best areas down here, and um, probably an increase being a surrogate for, for sustainability is this, the assumption I'm making there, which is not particularly good. Anyway, so what I've done at the moment, rather hurriedly last night, is to draw these stripes, which are supposed to reflect. Eh, I mean, you can whine about that, which is not perfect. So the, the quality, the, the uh, sustainability, status is from green across to purple on this plot. So I've given the scores to those bands at the moment. Uh, it may be that those bands are, are not terribly well drawn, um, but we could probably improve on that. And so in superimposing that on our uh, Kobe plot of case studies, well, okay, it looks pretty different. Um, does that have a better correlation with ethics? Well, as it happens, it sort of does. Um, uh, well, these two are not like, these two are not significant, so I can't really show them. But I have shown them because like, they support my, my instinct. Um, but they're not very good. But this one actually is okay. It, it's a very weak. Um, what is it? Twenty-eight percent. Yeah, it's a twenty-eight percent uh, R square. So uh, it's um, a little bit better than anything else we've seen. So the hypothesis is not really supported, but. Maybe, maybe an indication of very weak support for the hypothesis. Maybe with more data, it will look better. Good hope. And that's as far as I've got with that simple testing so far. Um, if anybody here has got a better Kobe plot area 
um, quality map, um, and I'm sure some of you have, um, Tom, and so <laughs> it would be very nice if, if we could uh, if we could actually um, have another go with something that's a bit better considered. So we went on to um, try and look at uh, a, a more complex, or at least a way of unpacking some of the details of these fisheries. And so we've, surprise, surprise, chosen my old technique of ratfish here, which has been updated recently. Um, and uh, here, the various sustainability indicators come from six fields in the ratfish analysis, which includes an ecological field, um, but also includes institutional, social, and ethical fields themselves. And the ethical, well, the ethical field is there, in fact. So the results are generally shown without uh, merging the different fields. So we've got a hexagon, and the point that you are on the hexagon, the closer you are to the edge, the better it is. If you're right on the edge, you're perfect, so that never happens. So here's a couple of fisheries plot plotted here, random to see how they go. And you can see this one here has a very high ecological status and a reasonably high ethical status, whereas this one in here is poor in both. So we tried to use ratfish. Ratfish itself, within the ethics, uses quite a complex analysis. There are nine indicators scored to give an ethical status of a fishery, which includes um, adjacency, iconicity, which is the, the, the resonance that that fish has in the local society, such as like for here, salmon would be it, right? And iconicity or cod on the east coast of Canada would have a high iconicity. Um, alternative livelihoods and other factors like just governance, illegal fishing, consumer attitudes to the fishery product are um, uh, included in this ethical analysis. So it's quite a complex analysis, takes a bit of time to do. So one case study we've chosen here, the BC Sablefish, here's its COVID plot, which comes from the Myers database. And it starts off in a very nice place down here, but then as the fishery develops, it, it moves towards, it's actually not too bad. It goes towards the, the target point in the middle of the plot and then jiggles about quite a bit. And that period when it's jiggling about from being overfished to being about right um, includes the recent period, <coughs> about 15 years, I think, since it's been an ITQ fishery. So it doesn't get a lot better, but it, yeah, it doesn't get worse either, so that's quite neat. And it's, uh, we've done it um, as a result of a big exercise last year, and, and which included some students. We've plotted the ethical status of, of these fish, the ratfish plots for each of these fisheries, including their ethical status. And here it is for um, the two gear types in the um, same fish fishery, which is a trap and a long line. Long lines are, I think, about 10 to 15 percent of the fisheries. So most of the fisheries are from the traps. And it, it does quite well. I mean, it's up there in a really good area for ecological sustainability, both gear types, actually. Um, and it does quite well in ethics as well. So there's actually here, with this fishery, there's a correlation between ethical status and ecological sustainability. It does quite well. It doesn't do quite so well institutionally. But again, all of these scores for a ratfish are actually quite in a good area. So it's a fishery that does quite well. So for a sable fish, we can say, well, the status is actually quite, quite, quite good. Um, um, there's some equiv equivocal feelings about the ITQ um, in terms of their social impact. But, um, the economics are very good, but the, the, the social equity of the ITQ, the consequences of the ITQ, is somewhat controversial. It doesn't get worse, like most fisheries do. Um, it doesn't get dramatically better either. So our overall hypothesis is weakly supported by this, this fishery. Um, but we didn't really see that until we unpacked those status indicators. Um, my second example is courtesy of uh, Nicholas. Oops, are you here? Not oh, here. Oh, sorry, Nicholas. Anyway, this is this, it's his results that I've used here. And, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but faculty members get to use their students' results. <laughs> students are aware of it. But I have asked him if it's okay. And this is the you know, Congrio, King, uh, the uh, Chilean Congrio fishery. Um, it's usually mistranslated as Congrio. This is not a Congrio, it's a kinglet, um, uh, a deep water uh, fish related to the hakes, but it's not a hake, it's a separate family. Um, 
And there are two big fisheries for King Clip in the world. One is in South Africa that's almost collapsed, and the, the other one is in Chile. Oh, I think there might be a New Zealand one as well, a small one. Um, the other one is in, the main one is in Chile, um, and that one has been overfished, but it's not too bad, it's still there. And uh, what Nicholas did was to decide to look at the status, both ecological and ethical, at the beginning of the Chilean dictatorship and in the present day. So we had two neat periods. Uh, we had a military dictatorship imposed um, by uh, Pinochet. This is the day after he, he murdered the then president of Chile funded by the American CIA. And what they did, these, these guys are still alive, but what they did was to leave heaps of dead people at every bus stop, which is like, whoa. So the population was seriously encouraged to comply with, <laughs> with whatever Pinochet wanted. And Pinochet actually owned a lot of fisheries in the end. Too. And then, then after that, um, there was a, a wonderful period after 1989, uh, I think it was, when Pinochet actually was forced to step down and uh, democracy was established. And this, is, I think, is the present-day uh, present president is a lady. Uh, I think her name is Bachelet. Um, and so Chile is a very different place now to what it was under that uh, awful dictatorship. So in the Congo fishery for the Kinglet is actually uh, part of it's one of the um, one of the valuable bycatch uh, species caught in the southern Hake fishery, which is largely a trawl fishery, although there is a long line sector as well. Um, and um, so right, I, the data for the king cliff is not easily available. The data I've used is a sorry, but it's the data for the Hake fishery, which is one that is the actual target. So we've got a um, Kobe plot for that hake fishery, King Cliff by Surrogate. And you can see that it actually started off like most things in the green quadrant um, and then shuffled rapidly up here. It's heavily exploited, but it's been trundling along um, and is still overexploited, but not drastically so. It's not gone, the biomass has not shot right down here. Um, and the hope is, the assumption here is that this hake plot actually is a surrogate for the of the king clip plot, which is not perfect. But it doesn't look too bad as the moment. If we look at its ratfish for the two periods, um, then we get a different kind of story. This is the uh, uh, ratfish analysis for under military rule, under Pinochet dictatorship, and this is the uh, ratfish plot under democracy. You can see some quite important changes there between the two. Um, first of all, the ecological status scores less today under democracy than it did under the dictator. Oh, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> um, the uh, social status, again, scores less today than it did under the dictatorship. And why would well, the institutional status is much better. Um, the economic status is also has gone down compared to what it was. Um, so that's it. The institutional one is easy to explain because since democratization, there's been all sorts of effort put into the management of the fisheries to extend the governance to uh, small-scale fishers, to local communities, and to far more groups of stakeholders than it ever was under the dictator. If the dictator just told them what to do. It, um, what he told them to do was actually quite good because the, the ecologist, ecological status has gone down as a consequence of having all these extra stakeholders, which is kind of a bit, bit not quite what you wanted to see. I suppose. Um, economic value has gone down, and the social status is an interesting one, gone down in democracy. I don't know what that really is, but the, Nicholas's suggestion is that people today are much more argumentative, there's more social conflict, because everybody has a say. Um, whereas in the old days, uh, people with different political views would, would, would come together as allies because they were all fighting the dictatorship. So <laughs> it was kind of better for so -called social cohesion to have a common enemy that you could unite against. Well, that's one one of the So there we are with the, with the King Clinton. So again, the 
hypothesis here is not supported at all, that the ethical status actually is um, not correlated with changes in ecology or in some of the other indicators that we've looked at. But you don't see that unless you unpack these different sectors and modalities. So conclusions are, um, fisheries sustainability and ethics. Well, hypothesis not supported yet. I put the yet in because I'm still working on this, right? Um, the analysis clearly needs refinement. The Kobe plot is not so satisfactory as you might think. Uh, it's not, certainly the simple version of the Kobe plot is not working at all. More complex uh, analyses using the Kobe plot of um, ecological sustainability status to be developed. But you don't really see any, any of the interesting issues until you unpack both the ethical and ecological status fields. So in fact, it's another example of ugly facts flying in the face of elegant hypothesis. Thank you. Uh, because we've not evaluated that using the ratfish technique. Oh, yeah. the, the ratfish. Yeah, we haven't done the ethical status of that. The yeah, the, the ethical status of the hate fishery would be an interesting study. Sure, but it's not done yet. Um, there are two sectors, and, and there's quite a conflict between the uh, large-scale offshore trawlers, who are largely based in just one or two ports, and uh, small-scale long-line fishermen who can catch a hake and, and kinkler, uh, coming from lots of shore-based small fishing communities. So that's, there's a major social conflict there. Um, and we've only got the scores for the, for the, for the Cumbria, for the oh, King Clip yeah. so far. Yeah, it's a good point, but it would be interesting to look at. And with hake, of course, there's a p potential here for a worldwide study, because there's hake fisheries all over the place, including, but most people don't know, the biggest fishery in BC is actually for hake. So. Within the ratfish technique, the ecological status is, um, includes um, some of the questions there, uh, include um, predator prey interactions through the ecosystem, and um, things like that. We, for, for, at one point, we actually used trophic level change as a, as a, the system. Maybe we actually don't use that right now. But, um, but yes, there are a number of e ecosystem based questions in there, so it's not just the single species stock, whereas the Kobe plot, of course, is just that species. Uh, Amanda? It's okay. Uh, she, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. She, she go told ahead. me not to, Anna told me not to move. I have to stand here, you see. <laughs> if you go away, you can't hear. I wonder whether you might get some different responses to the comparisons with the Kobe plots if you didn't treat them as categorical. Well, you treated them almost as if you were, they were continuous variables, but of course, you know, the way you allocated them, the categorical yes, variables. Okay. And a slight tweak left or right would change the category in which That's the correct. fishery found itself. So I almost wonder whether the Kobe plot is inherently doomed with that approach. And then you try to take almost a regression analysis with categories, which creates its own drama. Yeah. And you know, either I think you'd have to, if you want to take that approach, you'd have to drive, divide the Kobe plot into more sections to get a sense of the real distance between the fisheries. So well, we could, yeah, you're quite right. We could use, and I thought of this, we could have used the Kobe plot scores. But then the problem is there's two axes. So where do you... Yeah, you know, I, I don't I think yeah. I might be doomed, but certainly creating categorical variables, but then treating them as continuous was, was likely. To be yeah, but that would be a non-parametric test. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm more sanguine about using you know, non-parametric tests than you are. <laughs> no, I'm fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a yeah, question yeah. over there, first. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask. So you studied the, uh, on the six parameters, you had ecological. But within ethical, you also had ecological? I don't think we... Yeah. It could be right, but... Ecological damage. Oh, yeah, ecological damage. Back here somewhere. Yeah, that's right. But, um... Yeah. 
ecological damage, yeah, yeah. So that is um, damage to the system, to habitat, and to both habitat and food web damage caused by fishing, usually by the fishing gear, or so sometimes by the fishing practice, but usually by the fishing gear. Wouldn't that just be in the ecological? Um, there is something like that in ecological for its ecological impacts, but here we're looking at the ethics of actually uh, impacting both the food web and the habitat through the actions of the fishery. And we're thinking of uh, trawl damage, obviously, and even long lines can um, recently has been shown that some of the long lines, which are thought to be quite pure, um, actually do hook big corals and can actually damage coral. It was thought that trawls were the main problem, damaging deep water corals. But, but long lines do as well to some extent. And that's been recently shown. So we're thinking of that kind of damage to the system, which leaves the system less able, presumably, to, to continue to fulfill its expectations of humans and exploiting it. So, so that's why we thought it was ethical that some aspects of that are in ecology as well. Have you ever heard? Well, it's kind of a follow up to something Amanda said, and also just a general point. Um, so, so, as an example, that's a review of Bluefin assessment recently. Oh. And over time, what happened in the Pacific is that U, UMSY, uh, what you've got on your y axis, and yeah. BMSY, what you've got on your x axis, change a lot yeah. over time. Because MSY, maybe some people may not know this, is, a sp is specific to its, uh, a regime of fishing, like an age selectivity, mm. a natural mortality rate, a recruitment scenario, all these things yeah. which are time dependent. So there is a different UMSY and BMSY over time, and it changes a lot. Yeah. So it's not fixed. So whenever you see one of these plots, it is contingent on people saying, in 2013, fishing looks like this forever, then this is what UMSY means. So it's a, it, it's a very changeable thing, and, and okay. I, I'd just like to hear you comment on that. And also, that's something Matt said. Although the categorizations, yeah, they're categorical, these bits, but you could, in most of these assessments, that line is a big smudge of uncertainty. So you can say at any one state what the probability of being in any one of those quadrants is, and that turns it into a quantitative metric. So in the case of your state, that's right in the convergence of those four sectors, it could say that although it is technically most likely to be overexploited, and it's 25% more or less in each quadrant. And that has huge implications when you get into the Right, so, so actually, actually what I'm saying, Nate, there is a way of dealing with it. Anyway, I want to hear what you say about the uncertainty in these things. And, and that kind of yeah, thing. I mean, the uncertainty is there, and I, 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 my uh, feeble attempt to uh, compensate for that was to be generous about where the point blob, blob sat, but because right, yeah. my blobs are really big, yeah. but um, yeah. deliberately so, big, big, sort of smudgy blobs. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Kobe, um, the implication, the original implication of Morda's plot is, is that. Uh, you know, it's kind of fixed, and obviously that is it's moving back from, from week to week, I suppose, and certainly from year to year. Um, so that, that's, that's a bit of an issue with that technique. I mean, I don't know how you, I'm not quite sure how you it's a problem with deal with it. What's ethical today yeah. could be grossly unethical in 10 years' time, but yes. how you change your fishing regime. Yes. Yes. And, and that's the problem with the whole concept of MSY. And it's that, and, well, know, I, it's big, it's I agree with you on MSY, I don't like them. <laughs> all I was, but it kind of is kind of stuck there in the literature. Uh, and, and people like Pam Mace keep telling us, writing papers saying how wonderful it is to use as a reference for us. Well, <laughs> so yeah, I, I prefer biomass targets myself. Yeah, but, but if you've got suggestions about how, you know, what relatively simple uh, analysis would give a better quality score, then that would be very helpful. And, and something that's time based, like if the if the Kobe plot is shifting year by year, then you should relate it to the year you're interested in, I guess. But then that means you're also going to make future projections, which is a bit of an issue. They all have all sorts of uncertainty all over the place. So the second question I didn't understand. The second question was just, so it wasn't the question, it was just ah, answer that's what I this point, that you can get a quantitative score even though they're, they're qualitative, yeah. uh, they're um, categorical. Yeah. Right. Point taken. One more question. The forest of, 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 of Katarina questions. had her hand up. Okay. Maybe we can squeeze it in a second. Okay, I'll try to be very brief. I'm just like, it makes a lot of sense to me that uh, the COVID plot and the results he's shown by COVID doesn't really relate to ethics that much. Hmm. Because it's like an intrinsically uh, ecological and narrow view on stock status. And right. you know, fish is much bigger than just 
was decided of issue this year. Absolutely. Because change from, as Tom said, MS, BMSY and uh, UMSY are variable over time. Uh, but if you don't, I don't know, I would like to flip the results and say, like, this shows how they, uh, the whole plot doesn't relate to the ethics and how we might need to develop other indicators to consider as well, instead of, yeah, I mean, there, there, there is a whole issue about the, the hypothesis, um, really. Uh, in terms of management, it, it's quite interesting because um, the, the, the attempt is being made to relate ethics to sustainability in some way because if you're going to get policy people to listen to you, you have to be able to make pretty hard arguments. Uh, and to wave your hands about and say, this, is, this fishery is culturally important and blah, 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 uh, unless you're in a country like Canada where like for example, First Nations laws, laws are in place to favor First Nations culture. Many countries are not like that. And uh, so to try and um, get policy people to listen, you have to have quite hard-nosed arguments. And that's why a lot of people in the past have gone to the economics and started talking cash to, because politicians listen to cash, right? And, and you can do that, but we were trying to broaden that so that there is a more tangible case put in place to policy to say, this is important because your fishery will not be as good in the future if you, if you don't include the ethical considerations. Um, and, and it may not work. I mean, you may be right. We may fail. I don't know. One last question. So, trying along the same lines, you know, I'm wondering why you expect a relationship between ethics and sustainability when it's an ideal, but the reality is that it's sort of counter human nature. Yeah. Which is really driven by well, you profit. may be right. We I mean, may be doomed. Yeah. So we talk about it in, in a theoretical room, maybe what we all want, but the bottom line is making money and that often doesn't involve ethics. Um, well, in terms of sustainability long term, maybe it does. That's my feeling. Or maybe I mean, it should. If we can measure the right things <laughs> and we haven't got the yeah. better. Just, just one quick question. That long line fishery on the Chile and the King Clear, hmm. uh, is that a targeted fishery or is it high catch? Um, the, 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 there is a small scale fishery in Chile which targets Congrio. Target the reason is that Congrio is actually the Congrio chowder or baked Congrio, I can't reach it. But, but it's actually a national dish uh, because the famous uh, Chilean poet Neruda wrote a poem about. Congrio chowder or whatever it's called. Ode to the Congrio. Ode to the Congrio. Yeah, so, so it's, it's in everybody's head. It's like salmon here, like a big deal. So there is a targeted fishery for it, and that's mainly from that, mainly from that small scale fishery, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. Okay, thank you, Tony. There will be cake in the lobby for everybody.